On today's episode of the Mark Titus Show, Jason Tatum did it. The son of a bitch really did it. Broke Steph Curry's record uh, for most points in a Game 7 that had stood for two whole weeks, uh, which may not sound like a long time, but I'll, I'll put it in this context. The last time we saw a man score 50 points in a Game 7, Ben Mintz was still employed at Barstool. So, uh, you know, that... that And, and when, you, when you think about it that way, that is a lifetime ago. That has... That really is... Uh, very, very long time ago. But uh, yeah, Jason Tatum, massive game seven, 51 points. The Celtics absolutely humiliate the Sixers. And just like that, a Doc Rivers coach team is back in the fraud discourse. A lot of fingers being pointed. Uh, is it Joel Embiid's fault? He's the MVP. He's the guy that, uh, you know, was was supposed to get over the hump. He, he campaigned for the MVP pretty openly. Um, part of the reason we were supposed to give Joel Embiid the MVP and not Nikola Jokic is that Jokic had won two. And then in the eyes of a lot of voters, done nothing in the playoffs. So why don't we get a new guy in the mix? Why don't we give it to Embiid? And he's going to show everybody why he should be the MVP. And then he had an absolute stinker of a game seven. But then again, James Harden season ends. And anytime James Harden season ends, the knives come out. And also Doc Rivers just has one of those faces that when he's getting his ass kicked and they cut to him on the sideline, everybody watching is like, it's this man's fault. <laughs> it's hard not to think that. Um, so yeah, a lot of fingers being pointed with the Sixers. Uh, and I will point them as well. We will. I, I'm doing a special fraud power rankings because Doc Rivers is the whole reason I started the fraud power rankings in the first place. When Kawhi and Paul George and Doc Rivers were underperforming and everyone wanted to point fingers at those guys, I had to make sense of it. I had to rank who was at fault, who 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 deserves the blame. Um, and we're back, we're back here again with Doc Rivers, so I'm going to do that again. Uh, meanwhile, the Lakers overwhelmed the Warriors that series ended up being ha- about half as compelling as I hoped it would be um in the end size and athleticism from the Lakers just way too much and by that I mean Anthony Davis basically I mean he was just he was absolutely dominant and two questions come out of that series now is the Warriors dynasty officially over again for would this be the third time their dynasty's over uh it might be I don't know this might be the third and final final question mark we'll see uh and also what does this mean for LeBron's legacy um, is, is winning another conference semifinal enough for him to be considered the GOAT. We will talk extensively about that, whether he has now passed Michael Jordan. Uh, I, I, I think we'll dive into that in hour two of the program today. Uh, meanwhile, the Suns ended, ended their season in humiliating fashion for the second year in a row. Um, will Chris Paul ever win a title? Will Kevin Durant ever win a title? The answer looks like no. Uh, the Nuggets, how how heavy a favorite should they be moving forward in these playoffs? I do feel like if the Nuggets had different jerseys, people would be taking them more seriously. But unfortunately, their jerseys do say Denver Nuggets. And for some reason in basketball, that matters. I don't know why it matters, but it does. Uh, and Miami's moving on. The Miami Heat, the Miami Muckers, mucked their way into these finals rematch with the Celtics. Uh, Jimmy Butler, last year, you might remember, Miami had the, uh, the home court advantage. Uh, lose game seven to the Celtics in these finals. This year, the Celtics will have a home court advantage. They will be the heavy favorites. Uh, but Miami has Jimmy Butler, and Jimmy Butler can be uh, a, a Superman. You know, He didn't have to be Superman against the Knicks. He was Superman against the Bucks. Will he be Superman against the Celtics is the question going into this series. The answer is probably not. But maybe. But probably not. Uh, anyway, NBA playoffs, are uh, they've been awesome. We're down to four teams. It is not the Final Four. Um, I've seen way too many people calling it the Final Four. The Final Four is college basketball. This is the NBA. This is the conference finals, damn it. Um, but it's going to be a great conference finals. At least the West will be fun, if, if nothing else. And hopefully Jimmy and the boys in the Miami can make a, make a series out of that one. But uh, a lot to talk about. A lot has happened since our last show. We'll do our best to uh, touch on all of it coming up. All right, four teams left for the NBA championship. The, uh, the Lakers-Celtics uh, freight, runaway train. It's a runaway freight train. The, the Lakers-Celtics narrative. It feels like they're on a collision course in some ways. I still think the Nuggets are the best team left. Um, the Celtics are probably the best team in terms of talent. I keep saying that about the Celtics, but it's, it's just like keeps... Every time I watch them, including Game 7, including Game 6, it's like this team should be the best team, but it, it the, the talent is never the issue with the Celtics. It's the consistency. Uh, the Nuggets, I think, are going to be are, are should be favored against the Lakers, and um, you know. But at the same time, I think you see Lakers jerseys, you see Celtics jerseys, you start getting intoxicated by the idea of not only the Lakers but Le- LeBron James and the Lakers playing the Celtics in the NBA Finals is uh, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a fantasy that I think most basketball fans, and no matter how much you say you hate the Lakers and Celtics, if you're a neutral fan, every single person's like, if that happens, that would be awesome. So that's the that's the rub of this, TJ, is that 
we all don't want it to happen, but deep down, I think we do. I think deep down, <laughs> I think deep down, watching LeBron and the Lakers play the Celtics is is why you follow the NBA. That is exactly the dream scenario for finals. Even though a lot of us from Middle America are like, screw them both. I want them both to lose. We st- we still <laughs> well, we we like. Yeah, the, the 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 middle America galaxy brain move is like you 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 want to see Lakers Celtics because what you're cheering for you're just being a hater and what you're ultimately cheering for is one you get to see one of them lose and you're like yes this will be awesome to watch whatever fan base loses is going to just cry so much and we get to drink up their tears and then it gets there and that series happens and then you realize one of them's going to win though <laughs> and you forget to, you forget to factor that in and then the team wins and you're like damn it forgot about that part of this i was only i was only counting on you know the showing fraud and not the uh uh the celebration and the the parade and all that but uh i think the nuggets uh are in a good spot but the the, the, the reason i wanted to just do a, an overarching thing of these final four teams uh, I'm certainly not the first person to point this out, but these are the four teams ever left in the bubble, TJ. These are the conference finals that we got in the bubble. Denver, Lakers, Celtics, and uh, Miami. And it's got me wondering, before we see how this all plays out, does this mean, as we sit here today, heading into the conference finals, does this mean that the bubble was... Do we, do we take the asterisk away from the bubble because, like, you know, playing a re- quote unquote real playoffs has led to those exact same four teams? Which, not by the way, not just the same four teams, the same four teams with like the top players, the top two or three players on all four of those teams are still there. This isn't like one of these teams had a big reset or like a situation like the Suns obviously made a big trade and got Kevin Durant, uh, who wasn't on the Suns in the bubble. Um, these are the same four like top tier guys leading the way. Um, so the question is, do we take the asterisk away from the bubble or do we, or do we, do we overthink this and do we put an asterisk on this year's playoffs? Is that the move? Are we keeping the asterisk on the 2020 and we're also adding an asterisk to this one? <laughs> I, I think it's part of a grander conspiracy where the World Health Organization just declared COVID over. Oh, okay. And now <laughs> we have a replay. So it's like, yeah, not only did the, was the bubble valid, but it actually never even made a difference in the first place. I think uh, looking back on the bubble, like part of me wants to wants to say that that COVID. Every time I like rethink that part of living, you, you think to yourself, "Man, the stories that would come out of that, and I, the documentaries, yeah. and this and that and the other." But then when I think about it for more than like five minutes, I'm like, I honestly, to be completely honest, if they announce tomorrow that there's a ten part special about the the NBA bubble from COVID, I would not watch it. I. I I don't know. I, I, I think most people, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm, I should just speak for myself. But I feel like as interesting as COVID r- retrospect or like, you know, looking back on, on the COVID times might be interesting. Yeah. Um, the reality is I think all of us are just like, keep that shit away from me as forever. Like, I never want to relive any of that. I don't know. I wonder if there will ever be a time where I'll want to go back and like relive that moment in time. There's a lot of t- uh, like COVID era nostalgia already being put really? out on like TikTok. I think it's like a younger thing where it's like, does it times play? Were so times were so peaceful back oh, then. Oh really? It was just like me in my my room or something. I'm like that was like the worst time was the ever worst, in dude. history for anybody. <laughs> but uh, especially around the bubble, people will post bubble highlights and be like. This is what basketball really should be. Like the bubble was like the purest <laughs> the form purest of stuff. NBA basketball out there. No distractions, no crowd, just balling. Like there, there is TikTok, TikTok nostalgia around the COVID bubble, and I think it's fun because like guys were in there, random players were in there dropping like fifty a night. It's true. Um, I, I, you're right. Like because when you start talking about it. I, it, as I look back on it, it is wild to think that like like even dumb stories like uh, when guys would go fishing, they would catch like the biggest fish. I, like I remember yeah. laughing about that how they're obviously juicing these ponds for the massive fish for the NBA players. And uh, there was one story I forget who it was, um, but there were, there were probably multiple story guys who would go like golfing and then they would get out on like hole eight and park their golf carts and like disappear in the woods yeah. for <laughs> for six hours and then come back. <laughs> Um, like so, all that stuff. As you look back on it now in 2023, you're like, that is hilarious. And I, 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 I want to say that I would be into a documentary, um, re rehashing all that stuff and reminding me all the stuff that went on. But as I, as I really like sit down and think about it, I think like, dude, that like you said, that whole era sucked, dude. That whole every I don't want to be I don't want time ever. 
I don't want to go the, back mentally to like the yes. PTSD I'm going to get from like, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, oh. it was cool to play video games uh, in my house for like two weeks, and then it was just like the <laughs> darkest time possible for three. Yeah, it was cool for exactly thirty six hours, I would say, and then I was like, "This sucks." And especially, uh, I moved right by the beach in L.A. Um, right as it happened. I mean, like I signed my lease in February. Uh, I think I moved on like so it was like March twelfth, March thirteenth, when everything hit. Uh, I think I moved like March seventeenth. And I'd signed my lease, like, living by the beach. I was like, this is going to be the sickest, you know, I'm going to have the sickest spring and summer ever. And then in L.A., they shut down the beaches, TJ. Like, this was, this was like, I moved, that's how much torture I had was, like, I was, I could see the beach. And, like, if I tried to go to it at different times, <laughs> like, the police were, like, walking up and down the beaches. <laughs> it was insane. Anyway, I'm doing what I said I didn't want to do. We're, we're reliving it now. See, anyway. Uh, but the, the, the fact that these are the same four teams from the bubble is certainly interesting. And, um, yeah. I don't know. You know, uh, what? I, I think ultimately it'll it'll come down to what happens with LeBron as to whether we as, whether we put an asterisk on these playoffs. I think that's really it. I think that's what drives. I don't think the bubble had anything to do with the asterisk. I think it had to be. I think it had to do with LeBron winning. And I think if I think if LeBron wins a title this year, <laughs> we're gonna find a way as a basketball community to to throw an asterisk on that thing because that seems to be how it works with that guy. Um, let's talk about the Celtics. Celtics blow out the Sixers. Uh, I. I uh, you know, I, I first of all, Celtics fans are uh, Captain Ferdinand, our, our junior editor here. The Cap uh, Cody is, is is a Celtics guy. Before we even get on the show, like we get on the call to do the show, starts chirping to me. A lot of Celtics fans chirping to me, uh, telling me that my takes are bad. Um, to that, I say they're not. So you must have me confused with someone else. I don't know. I don't. I mean, like, I don't know where this is coming from. First of all, last time we talked about the Celtics, I graciously, I could have put the Celtics fans on my fraud power rankings. I, I graciously did not, out of respect to the history of professional basketball in Boston. Um, I felt like that was lost on these these bozos, these morons. Uh, Meanwhile, like the Celtics win the series, and now, like for some reason, people seem to to think that I was trying to say that they were they were frauds and they were going. I was saying the exact opposite, TJ. Was I not? Like I was saying, like after Game Five, I was like, yes, this was shocking. This was this was crazy that the Sixers went into Boston and won. But I'm not going to put dirt on the Celtics' grave yet because I've seen this story before and I know what's going to happen. The Celtics are going to win in Philly, and then they're going to destroy the the uh, the Sixers at home in Game Seven, which is what happened. Now. The Sixers put up a better fight than I thought in Game Six. Uh, that that was the the fact that they they were up. What was it, like six minutes left? They're up by two, and they just pissed down their leg. And and Jason Tatum was playing a stinker of a game the whole way. And um, that was a brutal brutal loss. Like that one to me, as you look back on this Sixers season, uh, that one was the one that would would hurt the most if I was a Sixers fan. I think the moment they lose Game Six, every Sixers fan knew they were doomed in game seven. And then it was like a pleasant surprise that they were hanging around at halftime. Uh, and then, and then the third quarter happened and, and I feel like it was like, yes, okay, there it is. That's exactly what we were, uh, what, what we expected. So um, yeah, I mean, I would say the Celtics silenced the haters, but I, I watched that whole game and it felt like TD garden was pretty loud. So uh, I don't know. The Boston crowd seemed pretty loud to me. So maybe they didn't silence the haters at all. It seemed to me like the haters were making a lot of noise. Um, I, I, I did turn it off towards the end of the fourth quarter I guess uh did did they did they boo at any point in this in this one TJ did they boo, did they boo the I didn't see I, I didn't know if they like booed them because they didn't win by enough like I knew they were up big but then like you know I, I wasn't sure if uh, yeah I think that the fans probably wanted f- a 50 spot a 50 point yeah. win okay so it might have been just like mellow like mid uh, okay but no boo. okay so that's that's yeah. interesting I find that interesting so, so basically to recap the last two Celtics games uh, the Celtics fans booed the team when they lost and then cheered like crazy and puffed their chest out and told everyone to suck their dicks when they won. Um, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. That I, I feel like we should have a term for like a certain type of fan that does that, that like when things are going good, they're loud and cocky, and when they're losing, they try to disassociate themselves from... That's interesting. I don't know. How's the, how's know. the weather out in California? <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. Um, but congratulations... <laughs> 
Uh, Tatum was obviously great. Tatum was this was this was the 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 best Tatum. I mean, Tatum's been great a lot. Like this, the, the issue with Tatum is never the talent. Like I think the people that 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 lose their minds about Tatum, myself included, at times when I when I want to pull my hair out and say that Tatum is like like there's something slightly off about the guy. It was never the talent. Like the guy has the talent. It's, it's the fact that he does have the talent. That's what drives you crazy. It's the, it's the consistency that's the issue. Uh, you talk about seeing the same story before with the Celtics. We've seen this story from Jason Tatum before. We've seen him have monster games and must win games. We saw this last year uh, against the the against the Bucks. In Game Six, he goes to Milwaukee, scores forty six points. A week later, after they had beaten Milwaukee and moved on to the East Finals against Miami, I think it was like Game Two or Game Three. I think it was Game Three. He had like ten points, six turnovers, or something like that. They lose at home to the Heat. Um, and that's not to say that like he can never shake that out of his. And then he had a stinker of a finals last year. Like it's not to say that he will always be this guy and he will never get over the hump and 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 he can't like, you know, this is who he is. I understand the man is still 19 years old. Uh, he 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 has a long career ahead of him. He can grow and and you know shake some of these these habits he has but the issue is never the talent nobody ever looked at jason tatum and criticized him because they said i don't think that man is talented you said the exact opposite you said he is supremely talented he scores 51 points in a game seven the issue now is that as we go into miami series game one you're just as likely to see jason tatum start one for 12 as you are to see him score 30 points in the first half and you have no idea what's going to happen and that can get frustrating and so ultimately where you land with tatum is like you what what makes people like lose their mind and want to be critical about him is that when he plays well and 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 everything's rolling and the celtics are, are doing great and the the boston fans are cheering for him and the boston media machine is is running and everyone's pu- putting air in, in tatum's tires and everything there's this sense of like tatum is kobe because he like tatum wants to be kobe basically when really he's more closer to paul george which isn't an insult paul george is a great 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 basketball player and paul george um i don't know paul paul george is hurt all the time now i don't know if he's still at his peak but like when paul george was uh, you know, playing for the Pacers and going toe to toe with LeBron and the Heat year in and year out, he was incredible. And I think people look back on Paul George and are like, "That guy sucked. He never won a title. He never went to the fight. You know, all these sorts of things." That's not how it works. Like, I, you have to be realistic about all these things. Um, but the issue with Tatum is that at times you, he gets treated as though he is an all time, all time, you know, like top ten. Like, you know, he's on the same level as like these legends of the game. Where he hasn't, I don't think he's fully earned that yet. And the way you earn that is consistently night in and night out deliver. Now, if you score 51 points in every game seven you play, you're going to earn that eventually. <laughs> you're going to get that. Um, but th- this is the issue with Tate. I mean, the game six was a great example. It's like he he did win the game down the stretch for them, and kudos to him for that because that felt to me that to me like felt like a game where he would like the Celtics would win. But without him, almost like Jalen Brown would be the guy making the plays down the stretch in Game Six, and then Tatum would have the monster Game Seven, and somehow we'd we'd you know have this discussion about how Tatum's a dog and Tatum is is you know going to lead this team to a championship and all that sort of thing. And I'd be kind of you know raising one eyebrow, saying like, didn't Tatum lay a stinker in Game Six? Uh, to his credit, he's he he was terrible in Game Six for most of that game. Made the plays down the stretch, won the game for them. Um, and I, I I do think there's a path where like he he can consistently deliver like this, uh, but yeah that that's game seven. I I rarely ever know what this phrase means. TJ, the exception that proves the rule. I I, I love saying it. I almost never really use it right. <laughs> I just like I use it when I'm wrong a lot. You know, like you get caught and you get you know you're like a team that uh, that does X Y Z can never win, and then someone's like yeah, but what about this team? And then I'm just like fuck. Uh, yeah, they're the exception that proves the rule. This time I know I'm using it correctly. That the game seven from Jason Tatum is the exception that proved the rule, and that like that's that's exactly why people criticize him is because we know that like he can do things like he did in game seven against the Sixers. We know that he's capable of 51 point games. So if you're capable of that, why in God's name do you just disappear every fourth playoff game? Why does this happen? Um, yeah, and then sure, like you can take it to like new levels with the hatred and like start, you know, and like it, it, it people, you know, it, NBA discourse is broken and we know that and people take hatred to, to insane levels and I'm probably guilty of it too. But, um, most of, most of my frustration with Jason Tatum is exactly that is like the, 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 the premature crowning of a guy who, uh, has, has never won an MVP, has never won an NBA championship, has never, you know, disappears at times in finals and frankly, like has a, has a supporting cast that is, is insane. Like that's why the Celtics, I, I've, I've been saying all playoffs, I think they're the best team. And, and, uh, I said about the Sixers series, like, I feel like this is going to go as long as the Celtics want it to go because 
they're ultimately like the only team that can beat them is themselves. Um, and I guess that's like part of the frustration too when you when you compare like Tatum to uh, other superstars in the league. It's like I mean, you, you throw how many guys in that spot with Jalen Brown as your second guy, and like you know that 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 defensive. Uh, all those defensive weapons they have smart and Robert Williams and uh, Grant Williams flopping around out there when he gets in and Al Horford being a veteran leader at times. Um, it's just an insane, they're, they're, they're a great team when they're rolling. We saw that in game seven and uh, there's, there's, I, I, I don't blame Celtics fans for being excited. I just like this, it also is hilarious that like they somehow feel vindicated for booing their team when I'm, I'm like, this is exactly why you should not have booed your team because the series was not over. If, if the series was over, boo your team. I understand that. Phoenix, the Suns should have booed their team and they did. That's a, that, The Sixers should boo their team. I'm not against booing, TJ. I'm against booing when like the writing was on the wall, what was going to happen. The Celtics were going to come back home in game seven and play well. And now all of a sudden... You gotta act like I don't. I don't. I don't know. I just don't like it. This doesn't sit well with me. But again, my my mother raised me better than Boston fans' mothers raised them. So um, there, that probably factors into it. To be honest with you, it, it is so crazy too that like Tatum has this this history of like not showing up every couple games. He will eventually pop off, but ESPN is still giving the Celtics a ninety seven percent chance to advance to the NBA finals <laughs> over the Heat. They're giving the Heat a three percent chance in the series. That's that, that's what I mean. This is this is what I'm talking about with the Boston stuff. It's like it's yeah. it's that that is that is you, you, there are there are a team full of NBA players. One of which is Jimmy Butler, who's a who's an all time Stones playoff guy. Yes. On the other side, Eric Spolstra is is leagues and miles 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 ahead of Joe Mazzulla in terms of coaching. Not even close. Um, I mean, Eric Spolstra, you could argue might be the best coach in the NBA. Joe Mazzulla, you, no one in the right. Joe Mazzulla wouldn't even try to argue that. Joe Mazzulla's mother wouldn't even try to like nobody. <laughs> no, nobody would argue that. Um, there, there's no world in which it should be three percent. I'm not saying it should be fifty percent, but like that's that's insane. That's I don't know how you I, come up with that figure. In show any, me your in any world where you just watched. It, t- it took them seven games to get past, you know, a Sixers team that was, like, falling off a cliff by the end of the series. Of course the Celtics should be favored, of course. But, like, it's it, that's that's crazy that, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I got to calm down. I got to calm down because uh, I, I, I do I, – I respect the Celtics. I mean, I, I, I see that they are very good. I'm not trying to, to say that they're I, – I, I, in fact, I would say to you, like, when you're facing an eight seed to go to the finals and then you're probably going to play a seven seed – I mean, the, the Nuggets are favorites, but let's be honest. Like LeBron and AD are, are a machine right now, and and um, I, I they the, the way they swallowed up the the, the Warriors and spit them out, um, which we can talk about in a second. I think you have to uh, you have to think the, the Lakers are going to advance. So the Celtics have an eight seed and a seven seed standing in their way. TJ, I'm I've reached a point where I don't think anything can go wrong at this point. I mean, it's it's theirs to lose, but. Um, at the same time, so like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying that like the Celtics are frauds and they're not gonna, you know, I'm not moving the goalpost on this thing. I'm saying like this was the chance to, if you wanted to see the Celtics lose, this was the chance. Now there's nothing can go wrong from here. I think the 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 bracket is broken wide open for them, um, and and that's that's what we're what we're about. To, but at the same time, say 97 percent chance to make the final. This is absurd, and and I don't understand how people keep getting away with this. Um, anyway. Let's talk about the Sixers for a second because the the a, a special fraud power rankings. So I'm trying to make sense of, of who all to point the fingers at, and there's a lot of blame to go around. First of all, um, it is weird how I, I don't fully understand how this this happens in professional sports where um, franchise I don't want to say curse, but like franchises have like a stink to them. It doesn't fully compute with me. It doesn't it doesn't really make sense to me how the Sixers can't get over the hump and they haven't made the Eastern Finals since. No matter how many different iterations of a team they have, um, they they hit the same ceiling over and over and over. And the Clippers like run into the same problems, where it's like the, no matter how much talent you put on the Clippers, they will find a way to mess it up. And then you ask like, why is that? And you're like, because it's the Los Angeles Clippers, and that's what they do. That makes more sense in college sports, I would say, because college sports seem to have like more of like cultural, like like the the, the team makeup can be cultural to where like. You know, if you're if you're saying like Big Ten teams can't compete with SEC teams, there's like actual reasons behind that at times. Where like even though it's different group of guys, it's like, yeah, because these guys in the South are faster, and you know the the, the SEC gets more athleticism and more. There's more like data to it that like makes sense, and I I like follow the logic with it. 
with NBA teams, it never really makes sense to me. It doesn't. It, I, I I don't fully understand how this happens. How like the Sixers can be like a snake bitten franchise that like can't get back to the Eastern Conference Finals, no matter how many times it feels like they are knocking at that door, and how how franchises like the Celtics and Lakers can over and over and over again like reset and always find a way to, to be back in the mix. That, that's that's really bizarre to me how that always works out. But I guess, I mean, the Lakers actually makes more sense because the Lakers will always be able to get any free agent they want. Anytime a, the best free agent's open, they just like make an offer and do you want to come play in LA and play for the Lakers? And they're like, yes, I do. Um, but yeah, that was- Devastating to be a Philly fan watching this happen over and over and over and over and over again, seemingly. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what is it about the Sixers? What is it about... I mean, the Philly Scum, fans, scumbag city full of scumbag, scumbag fans. <laughs> Philly Philly fans pretend like they're they're a cursed city, but I mean, come on, like they, the Eagles just won the Super Bowl. The Eagles just won the Super Bowl, and you're you're going and to they the, just you know, lost the Super Bowl too. You know how many you know how many cities would love to even be in the Super Bowl? You know how many cities was <laughs> that's 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 loser talk, Mark. No, it's not loser talk. <laughs> I would, I would gladly, I would, if you told me that, uh, if you told me that Ohio State basketball will make the final four, like every, okay, so, so tell me this, um, I will see one, well, I'm trying to think through the hypothetical. I may or may not, like, I may or may not see one title my entire life from Ohio State basketball. I, it's just going to like play out like it is like right now, where it's like, I have no idea. Going to every season, I have no idea. They, they might not ever win a title. I might die having never seen the Buckeyes won, win a national championship. Or you can guarantee me that like every five years we'll make the Final Four, but with that, we will, we will definitively never win the title. We will make the Final Four every five years, but you know going in, you're going to lose. I would take that deal. I would push that button. I would be like, I give it to me. I don't care. I want to I go every year to the Final Four being at the dance i want to be one of the four left if the rest of the world doesn't know we're going to lose i mean yeah at a certain point like a narrative will start forming where it's like how have the buckeyes lost 20 straight yeah <laughs> you know final four uh that part would suck but absolutely that would be fun i would take that like i don't how is it how are you a loser if you're, you're literally nfc champions you're champions I want to win. You, get, you got a trophy you had there's an award ceremony after you won the the nfc championship and and you got the trophy and you held it up and um you're right. You, you want to win, but they, they won the Super Bowl not that long ago. They won the they won the World Series like in what? Oh nine was it? Oh That's not even that. Oh eight? That's not even that long ago. I don't know. I don't know. They, the, they're but, just on like his, an historic losing streak right now. Yeah. If I was in that position, much like part of my takes producer Max is, I would be pretty damn bad. But I I, I would I would argue that like the. Like when Cleveland was really stinking it up but before Cleveland yeah. got LeBron, that's what a historic losing streak looks like. When <laughs> I think I would rather be in that situation than you would rather the, like getting the, to the doorstep every single time and being having your heart ripped out of your chest over and over. You would again. rather like your your football teams winning three games and then your basketball teams winning nineteen games and then your baseball teams winning sixty one games and you're just repeating that over and over. For, yeah. No. At least I don't. At least I don't have to get my hopes up. Like maybe I get like little heartbreaks, but I don't have to be like. The buildup, like I'd, I'd much rather go if, if we were talking about Rutgers basketball. I would much rather go to one national championship game not knowing what would happen versus what you said and go to the final four ten times, but know you're going to lose every time. I'd much rather take the chance one time and have that build up potentially pay off than have my heart destroyed ten times. But I'm saying, I'm saying, as it compares to other fan bases, what yeah. Philly is going through. I don't think you're getting a lot of sympathy out of people. I don't. I think the fact that you have contenders in every single sport. Yeah. I think there are a lot of cities that are like I would. I've been waiting my whole life to see one true contender ever. Right. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see I, one. That's the, probably the coastal bias too. Like. I would love to see one team I cheer for like ever actually have a chance at any of this good. to be right. good. I would love to like actually go into a playoff game and say I think we have a chance. Which is a luxury that I think. So, but, but my my point of bringing up the Philly stuff is like I I think the Eagles and Philly's part of this. Sure, like it, you're you're right. Like we're losing the World Series, losing the Super Bowl, the run they're on right now is interesting. I think the Sixers live in their own world, like separate from those two, because the Sixers have not won a title since 1983. Um, 
and have not made the East Finals since 2001. There's like a longer drought of play here. And they, they are the franchise that had the famous process and that they were like the, we're smart. They had like that moment in time where they're like, we're smarter than everybody. And we were going to solve, we've solved basketball. Sam Hinkie's a genius. When Sam Hinkie turned out to not be a genius, they were like, we're going to get Daryl Morey. who's was like a Sam Hinkie, you know, like adjacent guy. He's also a genius. He's smarter than everybody. Um, and they, no matter who's running the ship, no matter who's in the uniforms, they can't, no matter who's coaching the team, they don't get over the hump. And I find that fascinating because it's not like a, again, it's not like a college deal where it's like some sort of cultural thing or like some sort of philosophy towards the game. It, 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 it doesn't make, it, it doesn't objectively make any sense whatsoever. And yet it makes total sense because that's kind of how sports work is you just kind of nod along and you're like, yeah, of course the Celtics beat the Sixers. That's how this works. Um, but I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't actually compute with you. It doesn't hold up to scrutiny to me. Quick break to talk about the Barstool Sportsbook. The Barstool Sportsbook is now offering a $1,000 bonus for new players. If your first bet loses, get up to $1,000 in bonus cash. So download and create an account today. Use code Titus to unlock your $1,000 bonus. Be sure to use the code Titus. Unlock your $1,000 Unlock your $1,000 bonus uh, and download the Barstool Sportsbook like I did. I got it on my phone right here. Here it is. Um, one of the features I like, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but uh, one of the features I like on the Barstool Sportsbook is that you can bet against your favorite team. The bar You don't have to plug in the teams that you cheer for on the Barstool Sportsbook. They do not care. If you are a fan of, say, the Boston Celtics, but there is an instance in which you believe the Boston Celtics might lose the game, the Barstool Sportsbook allows you to bet against the Boston Celtics. You can bet against your own team, TJ, and you can win a lot of money. It's great. You can bet on any game you want. Uh, it, it, they have games in all sorts of sports. I, did you know this? Other sports are going on other than the NBA as well. As I'm looking right now, the MLB is a thing. That's that's baseball, I believe. Uh, NHL is going on. That's hockey for sure. Um, what else is popping up? Champions League. That's soccer. NCAA baseball. If you like sports, you should download the Barstool Sportsbook because if you like sports, you watch sports, if you listen to this show, you are a smart sports fan and you could probably be making a lot of money gambling on sports. And the way you do that is you download the Barstool Sportsbook, you use code Titus, you unlock your $1,000 bonus, and then uh, you you hit me up and you're like, damn, Titus, I tailed all of your picks that you give out all the time, famously, and I made a ton of money. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Download the Barstool Sportsbook. Use code TITUS. $1,000 bonus. Terms apply. Must be 21 plus. Gambling problem called 1-800-GAMBLER. But yeah. anyway, we have to figure out who's to blame for this. So here, here's here's my five that I here's how I power rank the frauds for the Sixers. Uh, if if you're on the fence and you don't, if if you're someone who dabbles on uh, NBA Reddit and you want to get in the mix and you want to call people cowards and frauds and you're just not really sure uh, where you should be pointing the fingers and who you should be calling out. Let me help you out. I'll, I'll power rank them for you. At number five, surprising uh, appearance on the Sixers fraud power rankings. I have George Niang, um, <laughs> who played four minutes in game seven, was 0 for 1 with one block, but got a technical foul when he grabbed Jalen Brown. Uh, when, when Niang was sitting on the bench and Jalen Brown, uh, you know, like goes after the ball and he's by the bench and Niang just. Like, oh, honestly, if I'm being completely honest, this was like 1981. It was kind of a smooth play that he gets away with and no one notices. 2023, 0% chance you're getting away with that. Uh, and he should be smarter. But the reason I'm putting him on the fraud power rankings, TJ, is because the second I saw that, I made the connection uh, that George Niang is a New England guy. He's he's a masshole. He's born in Massachusetts. He went to he went to high school, I think, in New Hampshire, I want to say. I think Vermont or New Hampshire. I think it was New Hampshire. Um... So my my tinfoil hats is just go you know my my conspiracies are going crazy that he's doing this on purpose he's throwing like there's 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 something amiss about this because as I pointed out on the show a million times over all roads lead back to Boston everybody has some sort of connection to to New England and George Niang was no exception and I was wondering to myself like I, I if I remember right the Sixers were up at the time was this was this a move it, it basically. Was this, a, was this a sabotage? Was George Niang sabotaging the Sixers? Because I think they were winning at the time. And he was like 12 year old George Niang came out in that moment and he was like, I want the Celtics to win. I just want to touch my favorite player who happens to play for the Boston Celtics. I want to touch Jalen Brown. Is that, what, is that what happened? I don't know, but it felt fraudulent to me. I didn't like it at all. You can't play four minutes and do that. You can't play you know, four minutes to do it. You know what Niang means in, in English? I don't. What? Mother. Really? On Mother's Day. Wow. Wow. Well, 
that he should be held to a higher standard then, you know? If you're <laughs> if you're gonna be named mother on Mother's Day, you should not be getting technical fouls playing four minutes. You should not have yeah. more technical fouls than made field goals. That's yeah. just a that's just a general rule that I live by. You should not have more technical fouls than made field goals. <laughs> If that is the case, you definitively had a bad game. Yeah. Is that, that was what, a bad what is game. that? How is that compared to a trillion? A what's, trillion? What's, that is worse. That is that's worse. That's the zero, 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 one. <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, at number four, I put Doc Rivers. A lot of people want to blame Doc Rivers. I don't blame you. Uh, his face, as like I said at the, the earlier, like he is he, he is a meme. The, the, the befuddled face of Doc Rivers blinking into the abyss. He can't believe what he's seen. That, that really is, like, ultimately why NBA coaches get a lot of... Because uh, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, most people that watch basketball don't really know what the hell they're watching. Um, it's a lot It's a lot more difficult to... Let me put my J.J. Reddick, Reddick hat on for a second. Let me see. I'm smarter than all of you, okay? Uh, as, as a guy who played basketball, I'm smarter than everybody. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I do think that most people don't really understand basketball at the same level they do football because football... Uh, play stops we reset all the pieces go back to the starting line and we re and, and so like each play you kind of have a better understanding of like what went wrong and basketball is a little more fluid I, i'm the same way watching soccer like I, I watch soccer i have no idea what the hell i'm watching and the goal gets scored and i just blame it on like the guy that's like standing next to the ball as it goes through the back of the net you know and i'm like why mostly the goalie you know and you're like why didn't you stop that um i feel like the same thing happens with basketball where people don't really fully grasp like the the fluidity of the game so ultimately like if you if you see like a a, a situation like the third quarter of game seven of celtics uh, uh sixers the, the the get out of jail free card if you want to be a critic is just blame the coach um and I, I i usually don't have a problem with that and certainly with doc rivers i don't have a problem with that but the reason i think people always just go to the coach is because there is an epidemic amongst NBA coaches that they just have bad faces. They just have yeah. like doofus looking faces. And I think when you get enough shots of guys, like the wheels are falling off and it cuts to a coach and he's got a doofus look on his face. I think it's just human instinct to be like, it's that guy. It's that guy's fault. Why is this guy not? Why is he'll it do, that guy? do like a long stare, like, like past the camera angle too. Like they'll, they'll get like a good four or five seconds zoom in on him in between like one of the, the 76ers players getting like yeah. the ball stolen from him and then dunked on the other end. And it's the same, like Joe Missoula, same thing. Like when Joe Missoula doesn't call timeout at the end of games and it doesn't work out, uh, then it's very easy to, to build this, this idea in your head that Joe Missoula has just got a doofus face and he's just staring into the abyss. You know, he has no idea what's going on out there and fire this man you know that's what maybe that's why me and coaches get fired all the time too <laughs> they're, they're fired constantly dude uh i saw a stat the other day about michael malone that he's the fourth longest tenured coach at his franchise which blew my mind it feels like michael malone's been at denver for like three years and he's the four of all the nba it's pop it's it's spolstra it's steve kerr and then it's michael malone he's number four and I was like, my God, this is crazy that they just cycle through these coaches like this. But uh, I have I have Doc at four because um, I, I do think he, you know, like of course, of course, this falls on Doc. Like this, this keeps happening to Doc. He's zero and six in his last six trips to the to the conference semis. But uh, the difference in my mind between Doc and the rest of these bozos at this franchise is at least this man has touched success. At least he smelled success at some point in his life. You know, so like I think. I think he's got that for him. He won the 2008 NBA championship, which like as more time goes on, it starts to be a little more confusing as to how Doc Rivers coached him to this. But then also you look back on that roster and you're like, how did they only win one? Um, but at least, at least this man has, at least he has like something to point to, to say like, this isn't my fault. Like I've done this before. It's everyone else's fault. Uh, but at the same time, a narrative is certainly building that he is 0-6 in his last six trips. Also, Doc Rivers, I think being named Doc and taking the job in Philly was a mistake from the start. I think the second you try to be Doc in Philly, when Dr. J is obviously Doc, that is that was, that was doomed from the start. And now it leaves us questioning, TJ, is Jay Wright to the Sixers the most obvious move of all time? Is this, like when Jay Wright, when he retired from Villanova, I called it in the moment that this is a Brad Stevens move, that he wants to go to the NBA, but he doesn't want to... Not that Brad Stevens took a year off, but Brad Stevens... I think if I think if the Oklahoma City Thunder called Brad Stevens to come away from Butler, he would not have left. It was the Boston Celtics. It was like the one, one or two or three franchises in the NBA that he was like, I can't turn this down. Because Brad Stevens ultimately did not want to be a bad guy to Butler. I feel like that was Jay Wright with Villanova. It was like, I want... Like, if I'm being completely honest... 
I don't want to coach college anymore. I want to coach in the NBA, but at the same time, I want to make sure when I leave Villanova, I'm still a good guy. I don't want pe- I don't want the Villanova fans to hate me for for turning my back on them. So I'm going to finesse the shit out of this. I'm going to take one year off. I'm going to wait for the Sixers to fire Doc Rivers. Then I'm going to slide in, not even have to move houses, and now I'm the coach of the Sixers. And now Villanova fans love me more because now I'm the head coach of their pro team. Nothing will be. Nothing's more obvious, and it's not going to happen. They're going to hire some other freaking bozo. They're going to hire Mike Budenholzer or something. <laughs> when Jay writes right there, <laughs> Monty Williams, come on down. You're the new coach of the Sixers. Uh, yeah, why? Why is Jay Wright not the coach right now? I don't understand. Why? Why have they not announced this already? How is? You got to at least call him. I would assume, even if he doesn't actually want to co- keep coaching, but I think it'd be foolish for them not to at least try. I see a lot of uh, a lot of people trying to argue that Jay Wright's done coach. Like I, I God, yeah. I hope not. Like that he's he's very happy with his life and he loves doing TV and he just loves being a hand <laughs> a handsome man. That, I hope not. Dude. I hope he doesn't love his life. <laughs> don't I hope he? Do, I don't want him to love his life. Dude, be miserable. Get back yeah. into coaching. No, he was awesome. He's great for basketball, and I want him to. What, what I really want uh, Jay Wright to do is what I've wanted Stevens to do for a while. But uh, Stevens obviously isn't interested in my ideas. Um, so interesting should, too with Boston. I think that there was a chance that the Celtics would have reached out to Brad Stevens if they didn't win this series, right? Yeah, but Ste- Stevens is done. I know for a fact Stevens is done coaching. I know That's, for a fact. Like I know, I know. It's it's. I'm. I'm uh, you know. You know he's done because I'm the yeah. one saying he's done. <laughs> That, that's, one. <laughs> that's Rico's number one go-to whenever there's an opening in the in the NBA. Dude. He's like, "Well, they got to get Brad Stevens on the line right now." That's my go-to for any opening, yeah. any any opening of any career of any anything. Um, <laughs> so if I'm waving the white flag on Brad Stevens, you know it's done. I've 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 I've, I've learned too much, TJ. I've I've asked around too much. I've I've learned too much, and uh, I wish I didn't. Being naive is sometimes. Ignorance is, in fact, bliss, as it turns out. But uh, I want Jay Wright to coach Team USA. I want that to be his full time job. I think that's Ooh. how he. I think that's how he gets back into coaching. But he doesn't have to be miserable yeah. on the on the day to day grind of coaching. He becomes. He's just the guy. He's the. I, I've wanted this forever. I don't understand why 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 we don't why we don't have this. I've been ringing the alarm bells for a while now that the rest of the world is catching up to USA. We're still better than every any individual country. But uh, a time will come. Like France is not a joke anymore. France is. If Joel Embiid plays for France too, we're 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 in trouble. Like I I, I still think we're favorites, but Victor Wimbanyama is uh, I, he he is Frankenstein to me, and I think we've created a monster. And I I think we need a guy to take over as a full time USA coach and and stop letting like you know Greg Popovich coach the Spurs and then pop over and coach Team USA and then go back to the Spurs. Jay Wright coach you either get Team USA or the Sixers. But either way, I want to see stars and stripes. I want or at least stars. I want to see red, white, and blue. I want to see the stars oh, on your on your quarter zip that you're wearing, Jay. Please, for the love of God. Um, that announcement would probably come like this summer, no? Because Olympics are next year in France, ironically enough. Oh, that they are in France. Yep. Yeah, we're. Uh, I'm. I'm worried. I'm. I'm worried. Now, now that you said that, I'm actually worried. Um, let me see here. I would assume those camps or whatever tryout process happens for that is like the eh, maybe not maybe it's next summer. Hmm. Um I was looking something up but no, never mind. Uh all right, forget it. I was going to I was going to say something but we'll move on. Uh number 3 on the fraud on the Sixers fraud rankings I put James Harden. Uh I think I think he's higher for a lot of people. I think uh, you know James Harden is an all-time playoff choker. We know this. I, I think in the totality of what James Harden's career is, he should probably be number one um, as as a as a he's a Hall of Fame playoff fraud. Uh, but he also gave the Sixers two wins, kind of in this series, and he he sucked in Game Seven, and he was he was bad in Game Six and Game Seven. I'm not trying to say he wasn't, um, but the reason I don't have him as number one is because uh, he played well in two games, which is. <laughs> Frankly, I thought when he played well in Game One, I was like, "Well, Harden did his job. He can, he could, he could rest now. <laughs> he can chill out. Now it falls on him on Embiid and and then the role guys. And uh, you, you want Embiid to win two games for you. You want Harden to win one, and then you want the role guys to win one as a, as a collective. That would that would be my philosophy if I was the Sixers. Uh, Harden basically won two games for this franchise. I think expecting more out of one of the all time playoff chokers 
was was a fool's errand and uh in, in that regard i didn't have him higher because i didn't think that like i think like if you actually expected james harden to deliver seven straight games for the sixers that was a you problem not a james harden problem at this point so i had him at number three but he does deserve to be in the top three he's on the podium uh at number two i put daryl morey who somehow thinks he's the smartest guy in every room he walks into uh, he whines about every call that doesn't go his way. Um, he's he's supposed to be like, he's supposed to be like the Theo Epstein of basketball, where he's like, I've I've solved everything. I'm smart. I'm I'm like a like a kid genius. That's like you know all all of you dumb former jocks that are are running franchises are idiots. I have an algorithm that's going to to crack the code. And we're like, oh really, Daryl? What's your algorithm? He's like, you see that line right there? If you shoot behind it, you get one more point than if you shoot in front of it. And we're like, really? That's your algorithm? That's your that's your fucking algorithm, dude. Um, which all that's fine and well if it works. It doesn't work. This man has been running NBA teams since 2007. He's had one in, in the time that he's been running NBA teams since 2007. TJ, as long as the Fort Wayne Mad Ants have been around, that's how that's a long time now. This man has been running NBA teams. He's had one team that's realistically had a shot at winning the title. One. It was the 2018 Rockets. Uh, and they were they were ultimately kind of an indictment on his style of play when they go 7 for 44, literally 7 for 44 from the three-point line in game seven at home against the Warriors. Uh, and, and they were so pot committed to the three-point shot that as they're just bricking 27 threes in a row, they can't do anything else. And they're like, we, we just have to keep shooting because this is how our team is constructed. And this is what D'Antoni and, and Daryl Morey have built for us. Uh, I don't understand how we ever treated this guy as though he's like some sort of basketball savant. Again, he, he's like the Jason Tatum of GMs, you know? It's like he's he's that's an insult to Jason Tatum. I apologize to Tatum. I apologize to all the I, that that was I crossed the line. I went too far on that one. That was that was the Boston hater going overboard there because Tatum is far better than Daryl Morey. Far better. Um, I don't understand how how he got into this position where like he is the guy that has solved basketball when he frankly has done nothing. He's done nothing. He's never none of his teams have ever made the finals, much less won one. And he's only ever had one team that was even close to like being taken seriously. And again, as I said, they lo- like I don't I don't get how this keeps happening. He, he's the man loves James Harden. It, it's it's I, I don't I don't get it. I just I don't get it. I don't get it. And he will continue like w- when he when he retires from he'll he'll make the Hall of Fame. He'll like get like books written about how he revolutionized basketball. And to that I say no. To that I say, Daryl, I'm not buying your book, and you did not revolutionize basketball. So there you have it. Number two, I don't I don't get how he he skates by in all these sort of conversations. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe I'm just I'm listening to the wrong people. But Daryl Morey is like, like like they they get James Harden. Like you want to blame it on James Harden? Why don't you blame the guy that brought James Harden in? Why don't you blame the guy that's like infatuated with James Harden and can't move past that? I feel like they kind of knew what they were getting when they brought James Harden in too. It was like I I feel like when that that move happened people were like yeah that's great but you know how he is in the playoffs yeah james harden's like james James harden's like i like i i i I can ball out every so often but ultimately i do this so i have money to to in the offseason get fat and go to strip clubs that's why i play basketball like you know this I'm, i'm 33 years old at this point it's it's no secret this is who i am do you love me or don't love me for who I am? And Daryl Moore is like, we love you. We love you. Come on, come on down. Come play for it. And then like somewhere along the line, it doesn't work out because it never works out. And then right. everyone blames James Harden, which is like, you know, fair ish. But at the same time, like James Harden's like, what did I do? I'm just being James Harden. <laughs> right. <laughs> like at what point does your, your reputation of doing this every single year outweigh the, like the good that you do in the regular season? I don't, I don't yeah. really understand. James Harden's like I I never asked for this. I just I just woke up one day and everyone said we expect you to lead teams to titles and I was like I don't want to do that. I just want to yeah. I just want to go to strip clubs. That's all He's I want to do. He's got to be one of the uh, the 50% that Pat Bev said doesn't Talk doesn't to actually <laughs> love basketball. He's yeah. got to be in that group. I think he's just a make shots guy. I think I think he's a guy that like when he when he comes out hot he, and I, I do think he enjoys that. Like when he's cooking, I think he enjoys it. And I think he's like, this is super fun. But when he's not, what, what, what does it like coaches say? Like you have to, you have to hate losing more than you love winning. Like that's like some sort of, you know, I think James Harden is not wired that way. I think James Harden is indifferent to losing, but does, I do think he loves winning. I do think when things are going well, he's like, this is, this is fucking awesome. But when things are going poorly, he's like, eh, I'm still rich. And now I get a, now I get a longer vacation. <laughs> You know, 
Uh, number one is obviously Joel Embiid. Uh, there's no, I mean, how is, how is it not Joel Embiid? The only MVP to never make a conference finals. The whole point, as I said earlier, is like the whole point we gave this man the MVP award over Jokic, which I, I, I don't have a problem. I still don't have a problem with. Um, I, I said when it happened, like, if, if you want to give it to Embiid because we're tired, we have fatigue with Jokic, be my guest. I think Jokic is the best player, uh, but, you know, whatever. It, it is good for the sport to get fresh blood in there. Um, you know, Michael Jordan didn't win 12 straight MVPs, and he probably should have, and LeBron didn't either, and, like, I, I, I get all that. So, like, sometimes you do want to just see someone else win it, and I don't have – if that's all that goes into it, I don't have a problem with this. But at the same time, you cannot spend – the last how many years two years three years campaigning openly for the mvp as though like you turned it into like like that was the discourse of the nba for a couple months there where it was like Jokic versus Embiid, who is better if you said Jokic was better uh you were positioned as like an analytics nerd because you you're, you're like a guy who doesn't really get the game because like real hoopers know that Joel Embiid is on another level and Joel Embiid is that dog and Joel Embiid does this and this and Jokic is just a sloppy doughy fat boy out there that's like huffing and puffing up and down the court and like these were sort of the the ideas being tossed around you can't like have that be what the season is and then the playoffs get here and you shit the bed this poorly in game seven it was it, like he was he was nowhere to be found for most of that first quarter. Like three like with three minutes left in the first quarter, I think he started showing up. But I like the, from the start he was like it wasn't just like the third quarter when the the, the the wheels started falling off. Joel Embiid wanted no part of Al Horford. Um, you can't get clamped up by a thirty seven year old. Yeah, it's again that's a crazy sentence to say. Joel Embiid that's, wanted no part of Al Horford. The MVP of the league wanted no part of two years in a row. He's fallen off a cliff in the playoffs, and I get it that like he's playing her, and 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 you know perhaps there's an argument to be made that like if Joel Embiid was wired differently, he wouldn't even be playing in these games, and he'd just be in street clothes on the bench, and like you know maybe maybe part of it should be applauding him for you know playing through the knee sprains and playing through like, he's he's banged up all the time. That's what that's what happens in the playoffs, and like maybe that's to blame, but I. That's how it goes, man. Like, if you're going to be the MVP of the league and you're going to be on the court in Game Seven, nobody wants to hear about you being injured or not. Like, if you're out there, you're out there. Like, we can't. We we we're not going to. Uh, we as fans are not going to come up with algorithms to figure out how healthy you are and like whether you're at seventy four percent or do you feel more eighty one percent today? Okay, so then, how do we apply that to how many points you scored? Like, if you're out there, you're out there. If you're not out there, you're not out there. <laughs> it's, it's that simple to me. You're the MVP of the league. It's game seven, and you're out there just like you know what the, the biggest like cause t- even if, even if he was injured, and he was playing through it and and all this sort of thing. Um, and he, he was he was gassed from the start, which was a problem in its own right. But uh, the one play that stood out to me as like this is this is fraudulent, and this is why you deserve number one on the fraud power rankings. The the backcourt violation as the wheels were falling off when Joel Embiid like just brings the ball up the floor, crosses half court, and then throws it back to James Harden without a care in the world for no reason whatsoever, just to completely it, it was it was an own goal. It was like what what to have a play like that is it, it, it it's beyond comprehension that the MVP of the league in that moment would do something like and ultimately it was inconsequential and Boston would have won anyway and all but like that was that was just a snapshot of like imagine like. Take that play right there. Imagine literally any other MVP of this league doing that in a game seven when the wheels are falling off and the whole team's looking at you saying, we need something, we need something. And you just kind of like lazily, like huffing and puffing the ball up half court. You cross half court. You're not even trapped. You're barely even guarded. And you just like throw it in the backcourt and get a backcourt violet. It's like, I don't know. That's That was inexcusable to me. And like that was a great example of fraudulent behavior. So Joel Embiid's my number one. It's anyway. the interesting quirk of like the NBA announcing the MVP like during the middle of the playoffs is you get to see like what guys are made of while they're still playing right it's like for if you're expecting somebody to be the the most valuable player in the entire league game seven in the playoffs is when they're supposed to shine the brightest and when they're supposed to like step up to the plate because they're that guy for their team and to watch him like do the complete opposite and maybe yeah like you said he might be injured but it's it's interesting to like maybe maybe the argument that they shouldn't announce the MVP. They shouldn't. I don't and think they, they definitely should. shouldn't give you the trophy on the court before a game when there's a chance that you don't they should do it. the series. They should do it when the MVP gets bounced. Wouldn't that be funny? If they go into the locker room after your season's over and they're like, Yeah, yeah it's just in your locker with like a <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> they wait till the season's over to announce. Um he also him saying I can't do it alone in the post game. 
press conference absurd yeah. just absolutely absurd and, and i get that like the, the quote wasn't as bad like when i first saw it it seemed bad the context i kind of think i know what he was going for but because I, I, I think the question i think he was asked about like can do you want harden back basically and he was like yeah i want harden back because i can't do it alone but um if i'm tyrese maxi i'm like bitch what yeah. <laughs> i'm right here dude like what are you talking about yeah like they're more me... media trained than that too they shouldn't be uh, saying single yeah. sentences that can be taken out of context that but if like but if that. you're tyrese maxi you're like all right if harden leaves dude we're fine like give me yeah. the rock like let me like i i can be that guy joel like that's what you would love to hear from from your mvp and your, your face of your franchise um not what he said so they should get not... jimmy butler they should <laughs> can you imagine i'd love to see a photoshop of jimmy butler in a sixers jersey someone whip that up Send that to me. I'd love to see what that looks like. I wonder if there are any realistic looking ones out there. Uh, I guess we'll quickly touch on some of these other series that are, I, I spent way too much much time talking about. <laughs> can I, can I fraud without... stamp somebody in the Warriors uh, Lakers series? Please do. Please do. The Corgi. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. This Corgi ultimate that you... fraud. I'm, I'm I'm by extension frauding TikTok in general because I've yeah. told you over and over that I'm not a TikTok guy and I hate TikTok. But you finally sent me one TikTok that I was like semi interested in. Yeah. And then finally, when I get one taste of, of TikTok that I might be interested in, it's it's fraudulent. The Corgi lied. <laughs> lied hard. Didn't even get us to game seven. So if if this was Churchill Downs, I think they take that Corgi out back and they just shoot it in the head, right? Right. Or, yeah, and that's a, seriously, we dropped it. It's just, yeah. it's just dead. It's the Corgi. We don't know wow. what happened. That's, that's tough. Tough for the Corgi. Um, well, I, I thought you were going to say Jordan Poole like the rest of America. What th- this is uh so the 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 Warriors stuff which like I I know we're super lit put a podcast out on Tuesday after the Warriors are bounced. I I guess that's why I spent so much time on Celtic Sixers cuz it's kind of played out at this point, but I do want to talk about it cuz um I'm fascinated by the Warriors getting bounced and Jordan Poole stories get it's it's like these these journalists were just hovering over pub, the publish button and the second the Warriors lost, they just start scapegoating Jordan Poole like crazy, which like I don't even think you really need to do because you've been scapegoating scapegoating Jordan Poole the entire series, which I get as, as I hate that I get put in this position, TJ. I'm a buckeye. I shouldn't be defending a Michigan man. Um Jordan Poole's erratic. Jordan Poole is not good. Jordan Poole is I, I walked back to the not good part. Jordan Poole is not good for what they pay him, I meant to say. Uh Jordan Poole, the 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 production they got out of Jordan Poole in this playoffs was obviously a disappointment. If he was as good as the Warriors front office thought he would be, they 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 probably are repeating as champions. But this is in the same way that people are going crazy on James Harden. This is Jordan. This is who Jordan Poole is. This is who you 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 signed an erratic guy who who can can give you thirty on any given night or can be in his own head and do absolutely nothing and screw like this is this is who this man is he wasn't even he, like like the way people were talking about jordan Poole in this playoffs uh they're, they're, it's like gaslighting me into believing that there was a time when jordan Poole was was just stringing together like 20 plus point games night after night after night that never happened or like jordan Poole once upon a time was like a lockdown defender and now he's just coasting this never happened so i'm i'm confused why like Jordan Poole in the past was good enough and everybody loved him. And is, is it just the contract? Like now he's like making so much more money that, and maybe it is because I, I guess I sort of get that part of it. I'm not really interested in that. Like I don't, I'm not trying to be an amateur NBA GM, so I don't really give a shit about Kyle. I just like watch the guys on the court and I tell you who's good and who's not. Um, to me, Jordan Poole is like kind of the same guy. He's, he's slightly worse this year than he was last year, but it's like overall the feeling I get watching Jordan Poole is very similar to what it was last year. Um, I, and I found I, it I, – I just found it crazy that he was like so obviously scapegoated by the whole organization out of the gate. Like the moment they lost, they are like, this is all Jordan Poole's fault. That was all the messaging. Right. I, I think that the one shot he took was tough, but like you said, that's a shot that he – that's just how a shot that he takes. Like he was a wide open shot. Oh, the, the, the one in uh, in game one. Yeah, the the I buzzer the beater. Like, had, like the narrative started around that when he had hit six threes that game. You know, right. um, yeah. It's it's just I, I don't I I never I, I wasn't really understand I wasn't following that. Like again, I, I I'm I'm not saying that Jordan Poole was all, as awesome. I I don't know. I'm just like I'm trying to bring the hysterics to like a middle ground of just like. This is who this guy is. Like I don't, I don't, I don't. What did you expect out of Jordan? Did you expect Jordan Poole to be Steph Curry? Because that was that was a you problem. That was not a Jordan Poole problem. Right. Um, but uh, 
I, I do think that the Warriors, um, I don't, I mean, it's, this is a, this is a tried and true thing to do in, in media when a dynasty or a team that's won a bunch of titles loses in the playoffs. You then say, are they done? Is this the last we've seen of them? I think this, this one feels different because of that. I think of the point in the fingers of Jordan Poole speaks to, I, I don't think it's a secret that there's chemistry issues. They have the exact same roster, TJ. It's like they, they, they replaced Dante DiVincenzo. They replaced Otto Porter with Dante DiVincenzo. Otherwise, it's basically the exact same roster that won a title last year. Um, so what changed? Other than Draymond Green punched Jordan Poole in the face to start the season. And somewhere along the line, like Jordan Poole has gotten blamed for that as well, which is absolutely absurd because Draymond... Like people, everybody loves Draymond, even though he fans kind of hate him. Like he's he's he's, he's what I he, Draymond is the the personification of what I said earlier about the Lakers Warriors or the Lakers uh, Celtics Finals, where it's like we all pretend we hate it, but actually we kind of like there's we all like sort of have a soft spot for Draymond because he's he's the guy we love to hate, or he's like you know he kind of feuds with LeBron, and we kind of like that part of he's just like a complicated thing. So when Jordan Poole gets punched in the face, instead of the the over the, the the immediate reaction and then the lingering reaction and then the reaction that should still exist now and we should always look back on it and say that was insane of Draymond Green to do that there was like this sentiment that like I wonder what Jordan Poole did to deserve that I wonder if Jordan Poole was you know the Jordan Poole and it's like the, the guy punched his teammate in the face and then if you if you pointed out that that was absurd that he punched a teammate in the face people would point to Michael Jordan punching Steve Kerr in the face as though one Draymond Green is Michael Jordan or two, like this is the same era whatsoever. Like I imagine that Steve Kerr had a different upbringing and a different like life experience, and was like a different generation. Whether you want to call Jordan Poole soft or not, that's the reality of the situation. Is I'm guessing that most guys, Jordan Poole's age, that generation, I'm guessing getting punched in the face probably feels a little different, and it's probably you know like coaches like Steve Kerr was probably coached by guys like in junior high and high school that would throw basketballs at him and f- fucking you know like strangle him and you know what i mean and like now it's just a different era back like the way the the, the 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 negative coaching and the negative like like that that so of course a guy like jordan Poole getting punched in the face by a teammate was probably that, that's what i'm saying jordan Poole getting punched in the face by a teammate i imagine carried a little more shock to it than steve kerr getting punched by michael jordan but like there's this fetish fetish i can't say that word they, you know fetishize. The they fetishize uh, Jordan punching Kerr as though that's like a great, you know, it's, it's what a leader does. Is he gets his yeah. guys fucking going. Let's fucking go. Um, but even if that did work, that like it, it might have worked in spite, like the, the Bulls might have been great in spite of that, not because of that. It's not like, it's not like if Jordan didn't punch Kerr in the face, the Bulls would have never won any titles. You right. know? So I, I did the whole, the whole, the the messaging around the chemistry with the Warriors, the whole thing stinks. And I think Jordan Poole is being unfairly scapegoated. Uh, and I think they're going to find a way to get rid of him, and they're going to pretend like all the all the issues are fixed. And maybe they will be, because um, you, you won't have that piece of it. But like that that just sucks for him. And I, I I will be a Jordan Poole fan forever just because of that, even though he's a Michigan guy, and and I'm not supposed to be, because I'm a bigger right. man, TJ. That's 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 very noble. <laughs> that's the big takeaway <laughs> as a Buckeye. I I do think that the. Uh, the baddies, um, the baddies sitting courtside meme might have negatively affected uh, people's outlook on Jordan Poole, where they see him yeah. being like playing flashy or whatever, and when he's not performing, they they like they look at that as like right. a, a, a factor, and that uh, I, I'd imagine could turn some fans on you pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, I, I I understand how it happened. I'm just saying I don't think it's fair that it did happen. I don't think that it's. Um yeah, I don't. I don't think a guy getting. I don't think a guy should have to answer all season about what he did to deserve to get punched. Like no matter what he said to Draymond, like if Draymond is the leader that he's supposed to be for that team. Yeah, I, I, I the whole thing was crazy. But it was uh, back to like the the series at large. Like the uh, the Lakers' size and athleticism was. It was basically Anthony Davis. Like I said at the top. I mean, Anthony Davis looks like college Anthony Davis right now playing defense. And it's it's the the West series beyond like the the fact that the the Heat I think a lot of people are just kind of waiting for the magic to die out. Um, the the reason the West series is going to be so compelling is because Jokic is is just disgusting offensively. Just like he he sees the game at a level like I he, he 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 Jokic is the one player that I I I keep sending highlights to my dad to try to get him into. 
um i i have i found myself just firing off clips to my dad like i've never before have done with nba players where i'm like if there's one player in the nba that can get my father to like be a diehard nba fan it's Nikola Jokic. Like that is the one guy, um, because he just play, he the, his passing is insane. His the, his touch is incredible. The way he plays the game is just so freaking fun. But Anthony Davis is an absolute monster defensively, and he had he had the Warriors seeing ghosts. That that was the that was my takeaway from this series is that you have a team like the Warriors that are just you know obviously obviously won four titles, but they've won it by by being unguardable and having just an unguardable offense having Steph and clay and uh draymond and the swiss arm as a swiss army knife role and all the role players they've had through the years wiggins and um and this offense goes up against like anthony davis anchored defense and they they, they get inside the three-point line and they all are immediately looking to do literally anything other than shoot the basketball it was it was a sight to behold the entire series and i got it wrong too i mean i thought the warriors were going to have the advantage because i thought the warriors would just run circles around the lakers and the lakers would be trying to catch it and i thought the lakers offense would i, I thought these games would be more of shootouts and the lakers offense wouldn't be able to keep up but uh it looked like man, men amongst boys, and that's crazy to me because the Warriors are basically the exact same team they were last year. That's what's crazy. Like the, the team that won the title last year just got completely freaking owned by the Lakers, and that's what makes this this West series so fascinating now. Because I do think Denver's the best team uh, in terms of consistency. I think the Celtics have the highest ceiling. Like when the Celtics are rolling, they look really, really freaking good. Denver is like the most consistently great team to me. But the rational part of your brain is like if Anthony Davis. Can can he's not going to stop Jokic, but if he can make Jokic have problem, that, like that matchup is going to be obviously be the series. That's going to be this because the the Lakers don't have a ton of as for all the size they have, they don't have a ton of guys that are going to be able to they're going to be able to throw Jokic. Wyndon Gabriel is not that guy. Uh, you know, Jared Vanderbilt is great defender, not that guy to guard Jokic. Um, so I don't like if Jokic can get Davis in foul trouble, but at the same time. Jokic can get a little lazy at times. He can get a little like frustrated when, like, if he gets a shot blocked a couple times and fouls aren't going his way. Like, does does he kind of get? Is there like an unraveling that happens there? That 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 matchup's going to be awesome to watch because both those dudes. There's no one playing offense. Uh, not, I'm, uh, Celtics fans are going to say Tatum because he had 51, but I'm I'm talking every facet of offense. There's no one. There's someone scoring better, but there's no one like seeing the floor offensively better right now than Jokic in the world. And there's no one playing defense better than the world than Anthony Davis. And they're going to guard each other, and that's going to be awesome. So there's a uh, a storyline to watch with this Lakers team too. Is that completely on the non basketball side of things? Kim Kardashian has sat courtside at three straight Lakers playoffs games. Oh, so, so the she's... internet, and it's probably not for Tristan Thompson, but the internet is trying to decipher which Austin player Reeves. on the Lakers is it. Austin Reeves is that that's, what they're saying? Uh, that's that's what where we're leaning right now. That's what my uh, my journalist confidant Jack Mack has a uh, his He's... early signs point to Austin Reeves maybe next up in the Kim Kardashian sweepstakes. <laughs> Is that good or bad? I forget. It's like, good short that, term. It's horrible. Back it's term. horrible long term, right? Yeah. Isn't there like a curse? Like if you, he'll be out of the league. In four yeah, years. yeah, that's well, right. He'll be, he'll be off. Yeah, I mean Kanye Dude. West, Chris Humphreys, uh, Reggie Bush. <laughs> Chris Humphreys, that's hilarious that that man was <laughs> married. Uh, I forgot Tristan Thompson's on the Lakers. Throw him. Maybe they, we. I don't know if I'm joking or not. We might see Tristan Thompson minutes against the. Well, I'm joking. We're not going to see Tristan. <laughs> Or are we, are we? I don't know. You never know, like because the, the the playoffs do work that way. Where every so yeah. often you get like it wouldn't surprise me if Udonis Haslam comes in and eats some minutes for the the Heat somehow. I don't know what context it would be, but I don't know. That seems to happen in the playoffs every so often. You just throw like some grizzled and you, you're like, yeah, yeah we, we we brought this guy in here. We, the whole reason this guy's on this bench is for these five these next five minutes of Game Four in the third quarter. We're gonna throw him out there. We want him to foul once and grab two rebounds, and that's it. Um, yeah, that would be something. Yeah, Austin Reeves. He said, "I'm him," and she—that's—that's that's all it took. She saw that, and she was like, "All right, well, I guess, I guess AR I have 15. to." I guess, I guess I have to. You know, Austin um, Reeves has a signature shoe. Does he really? It's what? with some non-major shoe producer, but he has his own shoe. There's like 30 NBA players that have signature <laughs> shoes. That's a great uh, Jeff D. Lowe dozen question, like a halftime oh, yeah. question. That, that's Let's a bonus back. round. That has bonus to be a round, bonus round. Go back and back and forth, name all the NBA players uh, who have a signature shoe. That would There's be fun, like actually. That's a great question. There's some crazy deep cuts. 
Um, one one question I had uh, about the Suns. Uh, uh, we we're talking about the um, Nuggets, Lakers, and then the maybe thinking of the Nuggets and the Suns. The Suns getting blown out on their home court. Who do you think should be more embarrassed, the Suns or the Sixers, coming out of? Because uh, I I saw it like this, but I'm curious your thoughts because you're. You're more in tune of what the internet's saying, I think. You're more in tune of who's getting clowned the most. Yeah. Um, I think in a vacuum, it's the Sixers. Like, right this th- this second, it's the Sixers. To be up 3-2, going back home, and then in game six, to be up two, six minutes left, you're six minutes away from putting the Celtics out and, and like, getting over the hump. And, um, like, the Sixers don't even need to win the title. If the Sixers beat the Celtics and then were swept even by the Heat, I still think that's 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 progress. That's moving forward with the franchise, and that's getting over, like, a little bit of a hump. Um, but to, to to come out of Game 6, like, complaining, you, you saw that? Like, all the they're complaining about all the calls that were missed going into Game 6. You do that after the series is over. Like, I, I, don't, I don't hate the move of, like, like it, it comes across as sour grapes, but, like, it, if you don't fight for yourself, no one else is. And if you really think you got screwed, like as, as annoying as it is as fans to hear it, like I, I, I'm okay with it. I, if like one person that should do it, it's the coach, you know, like go complain. But for like Doc Rivers to be complaining about calls after game six when there's still game seven and Daryl Moore is like leaking stuff to Woj to tweet uh, going into game seven. I don't know. That's pretty embarrassing. That was pretty embarrassing to me. But I think in the, in, total, in, uh, in total, I can't say the other, that word either, totality. There it is. Um I think it's Phoenix to lose on your home court. You go to the NBA Finals, and then in back-to-back years, TJ, your season ends on your home court where you're down 30 at home in both games. That is that is all-time humiliation stuff. That is just like... <laughs> yeah, but it, but, it's, it's like Chris Paul almost versus the Sixers. It's like this is kind of like hovered over his head for so long. Yeah, like, and I mean the Sixers or the Suns fired their coach too, right? Who was like a two yeah, time two time coach of the year in like the last like four seasons or something like that. Like, yeah, that's. Do you think Chris Paul was secretly happy that he wasn't playing in this game and like they were doing they were getting? Yeah, he like, can point to this fault. and say it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's as a, as a neutral observer, it is just very frustrating um, how willing. NBA guys seem to be to throw in the towel, like when their season, like it, that, that, that is, um, I think that's a valid criticism of the NBA versus college. And, and I say this lovingly as a guy who just wants to, uh, like the discussion I was having with Roan, I just like, I think the competition part of it and the busting your ass part of it should be non-negotiable. And as long as that's, as long as you're out there, you should be trying to win. And I, I don't care what anyone says, like the Sixers gave up and so did yeah. the Sun. Like they, 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 they clearly just like get to a point where you're like, well, shit, we're not winning. I guess that's it. And yeah. you just like start sulking. And that's not to say that college teams don't get blown out and college teams don't suffer embarrassments and all that. But you rarely would see that in an NCAA tournament game where a team's like down 20 at halftime and then they just come out and they're like, I guess it's not our night. So I guess we'll just kind of go through the motions and see what happens. They always hit the panic button and they're always like, we got to try something. Let's, you know. And that's very frustrating to me to just watch NBA guys just be content with like, eh, well, I guess, I guess it wasn't our year. We'll move on. Um, I would love to see some sort of fight, but I don't know. I guess it doesn't work that way. They should have um, brought back Suns and four guy. Yeah, that's right. That was against the Nuggets too. They swept the Nuggets. They, they should have dug that guy that out a, of whatever Phoenix local jail he's probably in or something. Uh, spe- he's probably Nuggets and four guy now. He probably just flip flop. You know, because uh, the 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 guy. I don't know if you saw this guy at the Celtics game was holding up a sign that said like, uh, "I love you, mom," but yeah. uh, but oh, that Jason Tatum. Um, th- there there were pictures circulating of him doing that for Michael Jordan back in the Bulls days. When this guy showed up on my TV, TJ, I I I instantly recognized him because he used to be at every single Pacers game I ever went to when I was growing up. Every time I would go see a Pacers game, this this doofus would be wearing a hard hat with the sign underneath the basket, and he'd have like he had like a bucket full of signs, and he'd always have these signs, and he was like one of those douchebags that's like I want to make this game about myself, and like everybody look at this cool funny sign we have, and we're like yeah we get it, you know you 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 you, 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 you it says LaFraud on your sign for the LeBron game, cool man, that's a great sign, you know like whatever it says, you're like yeah, but he'd, he'd always just be holding these, it, but. I, I, I got the feeling there for a while that like the Pacers were employing him, that he was like right. being paid to be like a Pacers super fan. So when I'm watching game seven, this this, this dude shows up well, holding the Celtics like he's a Celtics fan. And then I see the picture circulating of him. Put this guy, who's this guy? I got This guy's number yeah. one on my fraud power rankings, dude. 
just bouncing around from team to team, holding up signs. He's like the Marlins man of the NBA, I guess, except Marlins man at least cheers for the Marlins everywhere he goes. Say what so, you want about Marlins, man. He wears the Marlins shit every game, you know? He's not he, changing into the home. So this is just jersey. a guy that's been like a plant sign guy for since the Jordan days? Do you think – well, I'm, since the – dude, I remember going to a bunch of uh, of Indiana Pacers games. I've recognized the guy immediately. I'm telling you, when his face popped up, I was like, wait a second. Like, it, it didn't compute in my brain. I was like, I thought that guy was a Pacers fan. I see that guy at Pacers, but then I started thinking like – is he a plant? Yeah. Is he like? Is this a? Is this an NBA plant? Is this guy? Is this the deep state at work here? The the, the NBA, the Illuminati of the NBA. Yeah. Has. <laughs> that's crazy. Has if planted that's a this thing. guy. No, we, we one gotta of my figure least out who favorite guy guys is. on the internet uh, internet right now is the guy with the sign guy who's. You might have seen pictures that he holds up like a cardboard sign with like sayings on it, and now he'll go to like a bunch of like businesses and stuff and do that and like sell no. out for. At- if this is the basketball version of that, but it has been going on for 20 years, we have like a multi-layered conspiracy to go through. I think we need to take every super fan that exists, and then this guy certainly counts as a super fan. I think we need to uh, do an, an operation where we send invitations to all these super fans. Uh, Ohio State has a ton of them. Buckeye guy and Bucknut and all these these bozos that paint their faces and all that sort of thing. The NFL obviously has a ton of them. Um and, and throw this guy in the mix. And the guy at the Celtics, the, the ball dude that points that like, like basically any fan that goes to the game and is like, how can I make this about, how can I get everybody in this crowd to talk about me instead of the, the, the players on the court and what they're here to see? We, get, we invite all these people and we say that we're starting a super fan hall of fame and they are all in the inaugural class. And once they all get there, we put them on a rocket and we shoot them into the sun. <laughs> Your thoughts, TJ? <laughs> I, for one, would never go to a game at any level and try and make it about myself. So I agree. That's true. I am. Uh, <laughs> TJ, TJ wasn't nodding along quite as much. <laughs> Hold on. That's different because you're you're doing uh, – you're, Rutgers needs fans, you know? Like you're not – you're, you're actively you're, – you're like a missionary. You're like a Rutgers right. missionary that's like trying to like – Or like a action- hero. You're, you're kind of a hero, yeah. No, I don't care that you care deeply about your team. I care. You don't make it about yourself. You know, I've never, I've actually, I've actually watched games where you've gotten on TV before and I've never thought you've making it about yourself. Do you feel like you do? Do you, no, go to Rutgers, do, you, do you go to Rutgers games saying, like, how do I, like, I'm not saying how do I get on TV, but do you, do you, like, is this a goal of yours? Other than, like, wearing, like, the sunglasses or whatever, I kind of actively try and not draw attention to myself. Yeah, I don't have a problem with like people dressing up and having fun and you know yeah. like painting your chest and whatever else. I have a like the guy holding the sign and, and then he's like looking around. He's like, "Do you see the sign? You guys saw it? Do you, do you get it? Do you get? Do you want me to explain it to you?" You bring, you bring a sign like that. You're yeah. you're begging for a camera guy to walk over to you on the floor. Yes. Yeah, I don't I don't have a problem with uh, no, I don't have a problem with you, TJ. You're not on the rocket. I would you, you would be walking onto the rocket and I'd be like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! He's good. Yeah. He's good. Let him. He's, he's good." He's he's with us. Yeah, he's one of the good ones. (laughs) I need him to produce my show. (laughs) Don't let (laughs) No, don't do this. Uh, I think that's it. I think that we could do shout outs. I I don't know what I mean. I I, once again I didn't talk about the Heat. They're probably used to it at this point. Um I I think the Heat have a better shot against the Celtics than than a three percent chance, I'll put it that way. Uh the Celtics I very much expect to win the series, but um you know, it was, it was a great series last year. They're basically the same teams. You know, uh, Tyler Hero and Victor Oladipo are hurt, um, and that's obviously a big difference. But uh, I, I think the Heat are. I, I don't. I don't think it's like a. The, the Heat beating the Knicks was not a surprise. The, the what was so surprising about this like Heat run they're on is was really the Bucks series. I think them like kind of handling the Knicks isn't a surprise at all. And I think they've really uh, figured something out with with Lowry off the bench and Caleb Martin off the bench and. Starting uh, Struess and Vincent is um, doesn't make any sense in terms of like, can you win an NBA championship with two undrafted guys starting for you in the backcourt? It doesn't feel like you can, but also at the same time, uh, it 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 works schematically to bring Lowry off the bit. And, and I, I forget who it was. I think Jim Jackson. I want to say was like talking about it during one of the games that that the Vincent. Um, not coming off the bench and feeling like he has to be the guy for the Heat in the second unit, and he could just be a facilitator when he's out there. It's like Jimmy Butler carries the the the, the brunt of the load for the starters, and then you have Lowry and, and Caleb Martin come in in the and then having Duncan Robinson. Duncan, I swear to God, is is 
perfect in this role that he's in because they don't need him. But if he comes in and he gets hot, but he's he's someone to look out for, TJ, because he's a Boston guy too. He's a mass hole himself, or a New England guy at least. I forget where he's from. I think he's he's, a, but I know he's a New England guy. He's a Patriots fan. He's a we have to him and him and I feel bad calling out Niang, but I don't know. I broke bread with George Niang one time, not to name drop, but uh, him and him and Duncan are tight. They they that, that's how I knew he was a New England guy because I I went to dinner with both of them one time and they were Duncan was doing his podcast and uh. He he said something about growing up in New Hampshire or wherever the hell they're from in, in New England, and uh, I was just like, "Are you fucking kidding? Like another dude? Another? The, the, we're we're getting another dude doing a uh, a podcast from Boston? Like this is another Boston represent?" But then him and him and George were talking about being from New England. So then when I saw the when I saw Niang, that was the very first thing that came to my mind. I was like, "This guy is a Celtics fan that he's doing this." So look out for that with Duncan Robinson. I don't know. Something to keep my keep an eye on. If he, if he, uh, I'm not accusing him of match fixing here, TJ. But the Duncan Robinson I know would never miss shots. So if he starts missing, look out. <laughs> Start hated, asking some questions. I hated so. Duncan Robinson in, in college. Really? Like, Why? He was just so fucking annoying every time he played against us. It was, was he like, cocky? I don't remember. Being, like I should, I felt like I should have hated him, but I didn't really hate it. I I liked him because he. <laughs> well, he would like hit a three like in one of our players' faces, and then like maybe he would like flex to his bench or something, going down the court. Oh, and be yeah. like this fucking like this kid looks like his dad's a lawyer. I want him like I want him off the court for it. I he used to piss yeah. me off. It was like him and uh, uh, Bohannon, sure, but Joe Wieskamp from uh, Iowa. Wieskamp because yeah. he hit like a dagger corner buzzer beater three against us. That, See, like, I don't broke my soul into a million pieces. I, I don't hate the uh, the guys that are usually hated, or the the you know the white guys that are shooters more more often than not, or the gritty white. I, I probably hate the gritty white guys. I don't hate the shooters ever because I feel like the, I, yeah. I respect them. I like watch I watch Wee's Camp and Duncan. I'm like, you guys are lights out. That's that's awesome. I love you guys. That's, that's you know? just game respect game. That's just game respect game. Yeah, it's more of the gritty type dudes that I that drive yeah. me nuts. Um, uh, all right, shout outs. Let's get out of here. What I just think? wanted to say shout out to fandom, being a fan of your of your team. I'm not okay. directed at anybody, or okay. maybe it is, but I think it's cool to be a fan of your team and actually care whether they're good or bad and fight with them through the bad times and make it on out to the other side. That makes the I, good times even better. I, I think I know what you're referencing. Uh, I, I won't even ask because then if I ask, then we're directly referencing it. So um, we'll, just, we'll just work onto the assumption that we both know what we're talking about here. Um, but on a broader point, I will say that is one thing uh, that I do. I do think that as I've gotten older, I've, uh, I, I've not necessarily become a bigger fan of sports or anything, but I have... I have found myself saying it's okay to care about things as I've gotten older, which I felt like when I was in high school and like college, the lamest thing you could possibly do is care about literally anything. If you cared about anything, anything at all. (laughs) If you're like, if if one of your buddies was like down in the dumps, you're like, you fucking loser. What are you sad about? Get over it. You're like, my girlfriend dumped me. And you're like, oh my girl, my girlfriend dumped me. And you're like, we dated for nine years, dude. Like I yeah. thought, you know, you know, we have we have three kids together. We, you know, like, <laughs> and uh, as you get older, you're just like, you know what? I think caring about things is okay. I think that's yeah. that's a. Uh, and to your point, yeah, I, I think it's okay to be like, yeah, you know what? I did want my team to win, and they didn't win, and that really fucking sucks. And I'm actually sad about this. And you are gonna maybe get clowned by people. I said this on part of my take on the the, the second life advice. Uh, we did. We didn't do a third one. I guess Dan doesn't care about his third kid that much. Um, <laughs> his first two got Rosillo Titus shows. His third one got nothing. But whatever. Maybe maybe they maybe they finally cut me out and they just did a show with Rosillo and they're going to put it out next week well, they, or something. They, did, they had uh, they had Max shaving his face into a goatee yeah, to sell the block was, on this one. This one was a soul patch. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I said uh, I think I, I went galaxy brain on what kind of what you were talking about that uh, I think the reason. Uh, dudes love sports so much is that it's the only forum where we're allowed socially to be vulnerable. I think it's the only place where if I told you I was crying last night, TJ, you would 100% call me a pussy and, unless I said because my team lost on a last second shot. Then you'd be like, oh, 
well, I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, or like, sorry, or, sorry oh, oh I get it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I get it. But if it was any other reason, you'd be like, pussy, get over it. You know, the, the, but uh, sports is like the one thing where guys yeah. across the board, I wish it wasn't that way. I'm not that way for what it's worth. I'm a softie. I, uh, I cry a lot. I cry. Uh, I watch Wally and I cry still. Hell but, yeah. Um, you know, I'm okay with my masculinity. Um, speaking of crying, I watched uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. I, mean, I know it's been out for a while, but I finally watched that this weekend. Dude, this is another sign that I'm getting old. It's like I am I am in a way that I've never before. I'm getting very into World War One and World War II. Ah. Very, I'm getting very, and I think I think it just happens. I think you just start getting older, and it just sort of happens. It yeah. finds you. You don't find it. Um but I, I, I watched I, th- that thing. I don't know. It, it just that. First of all, great movie. But secondly, like I, I'm now going to be on Wikipedia with all of my free time moving forward. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Um, speaking of which, PSA to everybody. Memorial Day is coming up, so start watching Band of Brothers now or soonish, so that way you can finish it in time for Memorial Day. That's I like to do that. I like to. I like to. Uh, have you seen Band of Brothers? No. You got to watch Band of Brothers. It's, you gotta watch Ben, but maybe you're not the right age. I don't know. Maybe it hits different, like as you start to get older. But you gotta, when you get that World War II itch, you gotta watch Banner Brothers. It's the greatest thing. It's the greatest. It's the greatest movie or TV show or anything else I've ever seen ever. Talk about crying, dude. I bawled like a baby watching that. That anyway. Um, anything else? Uh, NBA lottery Tuesday night. Here's how I would rig it. Uh, Indiana Pacers get Victor Wimbanyama. I would give the Pacers first pick. I think, uh, the Pacers are a great franchise that deserve good things to happen to them. And, uh, I think Tuesday night, if the NBA had, if Adam Silver wants to win me over, this is, this is what gets lost in this sort of thing. TJ is like, I'll shit on Adam Silver all the time. Uh, people will, people will say to me, you're, you're being unfair. Why don't you give the guy a chance? And I'll say, he has to earn my respect. He has to earn my love, my affection. I will say nice things about him when he gives me reasons to say nice things about him. This is a great opportunity on Tuesday night. Rig the lottery. Give the Pacers the first pick. And I will... You know what? You know what I'll do for you, Adam Silver? You give the Pacers the first pick. I will never say another bad word about Adam Silver again. I will never say another bad thing about Adam Silver if the Indiana Pacers get the number one pick and get Victor Wimbenyama. But knowing the Pacers, they'll probably trade the pick. They'll trade down and then draft like Grady Dick. <laughs> that does sound like, yeah, that Indiana like Pacer, Grady Dick. The Pacers would be like, yeah. we didn't we didn't like his his medicals. We didn't like Wimbenyama's medicals. There was a little concern there, so we're going to go ahead and trade down and take Grady Dick with the sixth pick. And I'm going to just lose my mind. And, um, I, Who's I, in the t- running for the first pick, other than, you know, uh, other than pit, the Pacers? Piss you guys. I like that you said you guys. <laughs> you're, just every, in, you're just the no, state uh, of Indiana when I think about yeah. basketball. So. No, every every like real Pacers fan probably hates yeah. that I, pretend, I cosplay <laughs> a Pacers fan. Um, uh, the, the Pistons have the best shot. I think it's Rockets 2, Spurs 3, I want to say. Hornets 4, is it? Yes. Uh, you're looking at it? Who, who's from it. there? Uh, Portland, Orlando, Indiana, and then the Wizards. I think of those top five, Portland is the one that I would rig it for. I think Damian Lillard deserves to be rewarded for uh, sticking to his team. And, and um, Portland's had so much bad luck through the years, and they deserve. But you know, as soon as as soon as Portland wins it and they draft Wimbenyama, everyone's gonna meme the shit out of him that he's going. Uh, R.I.P. Wimbenyama. He's gonna definitely be injured now. <laughs> I guess this means he's a bust. So maybe I don't wish that on him. But I, I if, if there's one franchise in that mix that deserves Victor Wimbanyama, it's Portland, if not the um, Pacers. So anyway. I will say, Victor Wimbanyama, you are a San Antonio Spur. Yeah. Give Popovich one little toy, one last toy on the way out. He doesn't deserve this, though. They got <laughs> they drafted they drafted Tim Duncan, dude. That's so unfair. They were a great team, and then they are and then they added Tim Duncan. That's absurd. That's that's so stupid, and I'm very jealous that that got to happen for the Spurs. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I think uh, the Pacers should get him. Um, I'm looking through my notes. What? Oh, McKenzie and Baco to uh, Indiana. That was another shout out. I was gonna get. Yeah, Hoosiers got uh, your guy. He's a Jersey kid, right? Yeah, Rezo Catholic, Gil St. Bernards. Shout out Mike Woodson, dude. The Mike Woodson was hired. Everyone was clowning him like he was. Like the Indiana made a huge mistake, and yeah, um, they did not make a mistake, DJ. They 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 said uh, 
I, it, it was funny. I remember it was Jeff Goodman wrote an article that said uh, that Mike Woods. Sorry, Indiana fans. I think this was actually the headline. Sorry, Indiana fans. Mike Woodson is not going to be the next Jawan Howard. And it's hilarious now to look up just a couple years later, and any, every Indiana fan is like, "Thank fucking God." Yeah. <laughs> Could not be happier that he's not the next Jawan Howard. Has uh, Has Rothstein tweeted Could out it, that the Big Ten runs through Bloomington again yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, when that happens, we'll know that Indiana's <laughs> back. Um, but no, Goodman was actually right. Indiana fans hated Goodman when he wrote that, but he yeah. was actually, as it turns out, telling the truth. He's not going to be the next one, Howard. Uh, Jeremy Roach back at Duke. Also, Duke Duke's getting some preseason number one buzz, so that'll be fun. Kentucky will be up there, too. I don't think they'll be number one. I think that Can't. The, those days are over of like trusting John Calipari with a bunch of freshmen just out of the gate. He's got to kind of show us before we give him number one. But they'll be up there. Kansas is going to be – I think Kansas will probably be number one. I'm excited to see. I think we'll that see. Duke, Duke has a good chance to like return to that villain role this year. I think yeah. that Jared McCain right now is like beloved as a high school player because he's like TikTok famous. But as soon as he starts like he's he's going to be like the hated the 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 player that other student sections hate because he's going to be like doing a TikTok dance in the warm-ups yeah. and then dropping 40 on you and then doing yeah. another TikTok dance. Either that right. or it works in the exact opposite way where Duke fans will hate him if he doesn't perform that well because he's dancing. I, I think you're, th- this is this is going to be the identity year for John Shire's tenure at Duke. This is going to the tone setter. This is going to be the tone setter. Last year was a free year. You're taking over for K. Uh, you're just kind of looking over your shoulder wondering if K wants his job back. This year is your first real year and this is going to decide the, the the future of Duke basketball will be set in stone this year. I think you're right. I think we we're going to decide we're going to learn really quickly whether John Shire's Duke basketball teams are hateable or not, and whether we should all hate John Shire like we did Coach K. I'm sorry, Mr. K, not the dog. Right. We love the dog. We love Mr. the dog. Mr. K, the special advisor to the director the of special. NBA <laughs> special teams operations, Esquire. Um, Galaxy Brain, if you're a Magic fan, uh. I don't think Orlando is getting the number one pick because Paolo is the golden goose. That's that's probably not the right. The golden child. <laughs> the golden whatever. The guy uh, for the magic. And you have Mr. K being the special advisor to the assistant of the director of operations. Um, and you have Adam Silver running the ship. I don't think they're going to fuck over Paolo like that. I don't think you're going to give Orlando the number one pick to have Victor step in and kick Paolo to the curb. So Orlando's not going to get the if if Orlando so here's here's the thing if if Adam Silver gives Indy the number one pick I'll say nothing but nice things not I'll, I'll just never talk shit about him again but if Adam Silver does not give Indy the number one pick and also Orlando does not get the number one pick then it is confirmed that he is rigging this and that there is a that the Duke Illuminati is pulling strings and that's the reason Orlando didn't get the number one pick. So we'll see. If Orlando doesn't get the number one pick, if Orlando and Indy don't get the number one pick, the fix is in, and the fraudulent behavior is on full display, and they're, yeah. and they're televising it. And if Tatum wins the NBA championship this year? That's true, dude. That's true. Shire just tweeted a video playing one-on-one with Tatum like yesterday. So. That's what I'm saying, dude. And every time I bring this stuff up, everyone thinks I'm the crazy one. That's what, that's what, that's what gets me the most, TJ. It's not that, like... It's not that it's happening. It's that when I when I put a light on it, instead yeah. of like getting a medal, instead of getting like a, an award, instead of getting a round of applause and an attaboy, people think I'm crazy. I need so you I'm, shopped over Charlie's face and it's always yeah. sunny with all of the lines. Just pictures of Coach K, Mr. K's face all over the place. Um, I think that's it. That's all I got. Uh, you play the Zelda game? Hands. Dude, I got it. I, I, I started it and... Uh, I wasn't in the right headspace. It was like too much. It, it was too like it, it. took me right back. Like I, the, the answer is yes. Um, but I haven't really dove in because it, like I, it, it immediately was like, oh, that's right. I have to devote like hours. So what I'm doing is my plan, and I think this is genius. Um, I am waiting until I'm flying to New York on Sunday for the dozen tournament. I'm gonna be yeah. Next so ne- next week we'll do shows in person. Um, on the whole flight, I'm taking my switch and I'm plugging it into the charger. You know, I'm just I'm I'm going head down on the entire flight and I'm just diving into high roll on the flight and that's that's going to be my introduction because like I I I said it I like barely even got like set up and I looked up and I'd burned like three and a half hours yeah <laughs> and I was like I can't I can't because that's the whole reason I I told you that's the whole reason I like got a switch in the first place was because 
I do get addicted to video games. And if I start playing them too much, I will sit there. I, I will literally sit there and do nothing else for like 12 hours. And I have to, I bought the switch. Cause like those games are more suited to like, just kind of dabbling. You just play like a little Mario party here and there. And it's just like, you know, or like fucking you do some races on Mario Kart for 30 minutes. You say that was enough. All right, I'm done. Whatever. It's not as immersive. Zelda is the one game that, that is, is definitely immersive. Yeah. And so I, st- I started playing it and I got sucked into it and I was like, oh no, it's happening and I don't want my whole weekend to disappear. So that's my plan. Did you do you do you do you get a switch? I need to do. Some you gotta stuff. get a switch, dude. Yeah. You gotta get a switch. I'm long overdue. I just I don't I don't want to commit myself like you said you, to. Do you like the? Uh, did you ever like play like uh, Nintendo's grow like the like I Mario had, uh, was like, Zelda or Mario ever a thing for you? I had like a DS growing up and a Wii. Okay. But I was a PlayStation kid. Yeah, so I I see like I the first the first game console I ever got was a Super Nintendo. Uh my brother, it was like a joint Christmas present. We got like one Christmas present as a joint sibling partnership for my parents. <laughs> and it was a Super Nintendo in like 1993 or something. Um and that was the first video games we ever played and for that reason I'm like a Mario kid basically. So like yeah. I was just hooked on like so my default no matter how, if I, I, even if I try to swear off video games forever, like the one video game I'll always go back to is like anything Mario related, just because. Yeah. That was how I started, but yeah, I had you're a, a little younger, so you you were what like PS one, PS two. I was born and there was a PS one in the house, I'm sure, and then PS two release day, PS three release day, PS four release day. So. Yeah. My dad's very into video games as well, so he kind of bred me into it. I don't even have kids. I'm a long way from having kids, and I already want to kick my own kids' asses because they, I will buy them everything. And not to say my parents weren't good parents. They were awesome parents. They were school teachers in rural Indiana. So, you know, like if if, if we wanted to... My, my parents did a great job of lying to us and telling us that, like, video games came out like a year and a half after they actually came out because there was no internet there was no like i guess like kids at school could tell you know but like my parents would do a good enough job of lying they they would never lie to me so i'd believe my parents i'd be like how come how come he got the new 64 they get a nintendo 64 and they're like no that's because his dad works at nintendo i was like oh okay and i just believe my parents um but anyway like that was that was always the struggle in our house was like we we you know we we never got the video game or the the game consoles we wanted and i'm i'm going that that's how i'm going to overcompensate as a parent is i'm going to buy my kids the Everything. second they want a playstation 13 i'm going to be like yes but like dad it costs four thousand dollars is that too much money for you and i'm be like no no you know why because nine-year-old mark would have loved for his parents to spend four thousand dollars <laughs> i do uh, envy like going to the store and looking at games and being like what is that oh like, yeah I, I used to go to like blockbuster and like rent games when i was a little kid like growing up and it would just be like yeah what's the shiniest looking cover let me rent this for two weeks and then try and play through it do you remember having memory cards oh yeah are you are you that are you old enough to remember that yeah PS2, we have PS2. To... a memory card would hold eight megabytes of storage <laughs> yeah. with th- which this now holds like 500 times as much sto- more than that, like five thousand <laughs> times as much storage um yeah the 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 signs of uh I, I i my parents listened to the show by the way and i'm gonna get a phone call from my mom and dad saying like sorry we neglected you and were terrible parents they were not so for the record coming off of mother's day we're recording this the day after mother's day and i'm attacking my parents they were great parents they did the best they could it's just they we, we were not a rich household um but that was that was the sign growing up tj when i would go visit friends the two things i remember as a kid thinking the, the the how i knew people were rich were if you had multiple video game consoles i was like holy shit dude yeah. you have a playstation and an xbox yeah. what i didn't even They're know like, that yeah, was allowed what? until yeah. i was like 10 <laughs> yeah i was like how do you have like how how was that like you're so how, how, how what, what lie did you tell your parents and they're like <laughs> I didn't tell my parents a lie. I asked them for both and they got me both. And I'm like, oh my God. And then the other thing was I would go to some friends' houses or like, a, you know, friends of friends' houses in like high school and junior high. And if they had a room that just was an extra room, it would blow my mind. I was like, what do you mean? You have, you have just an extra bed. Like, you're like yeah, that's the playroom. 
And I'm like, what? The, what do you, it's a playroom. You're like, yeah, yeah, it's just like kind of where we play. You know, like we set up the video games and we just kind of have. I'm like, how do you? It's like I share a bedroom with my brother. How do you have a playroom? <laughs> They're like, I don't know. I guess because my dad's a lawyer and yeah. and your dad is a teacher. You idiot. <laughs> look at look so, at look look at. I'm sure those kids aren't podcasters now. You proved mm-hmm. them wrong. Suck it, all, all you all you rich kids. I bet your lives suck now, because rich kids famously grow up to have terrible lives, and yeah. they never... <laughs> and I'm a podcaster that can get a Nintendo Switch and play it on an airplane. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to play it on an airplane. And I'm going to be, you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to be in Comfort Plus. I'm going to be in the Premier Plus. Like, oh, that's almost first class, dude. Almost first class. That's leg room. I have plenty of leg room. And I get a free drink. I think one or two. I've never pushed the limits. I've never asked for a third. Maybe I do get three. I don't know. We might find out on this flight. I might I might feel like rolling the dice. I might ask for a third. But I get two free ones, I know, at least. So, who's made it now, TJ? Yeah. Who's made it now? <laughs> um, all right. We're rambling. That's enough. Let's get out of here. Uh, we'll, uh, yeah, game start. Uh, lottery tomorrow night, Tuesday. Uh, combine starts. Western Conference Finals start Tuesday. And we'll do a show. We'll do a show Wednesday night after the uh, after game one of the... Uh, uh, Celtics Heat Series too, so we'll have that to talk about. Fun times coming up on Thursday. See you guys then.